prophet Isaiah declares as a mouthpiece for God the following. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Some moments of our lives and some texts of Scripture remind us of what Isaiah spoke. Some moments of our lives and some texts of Scripture help us recapture what we might call an appropriate level of awe towards God. An appropriate feeling of being in wonder, being in reverential fear, awe towards God, His Word, and His ways. For example, in our normal lives, I think there are many awe-inspiring moments, such as the birth of a child. That's awesome! It's a miracle! I can't stand to watch it! It nearly makes me pass out every time! But I walk away saying, what just happened there? Awesome! How about that first time you went to see, and you can fill the blank, Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, that overlook up high in the Smoky Mountains, and that feeling that you felt in that moment as you soaked in the grandeur of God's creation. How do we describe it? It was awesome. Moms, how about watching your child and experiencing the joy vicariously as they deliver their first performance, their first speech, their first solo, they score their first bucket, they get their first hit, and in that moment, the recognition, this parenting thing is awesome. And in Scripture, I believe that there are also many awe-inspiring texts. And I don't think you have to look hard to find them. For instance, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there's light. How do you respond to a God who speaks? And nothing becomes something. There's only one response. Jaw hits the floor. I'm in awe. And then in Genesis 3, 9, after Adam rebels, not only rebelling, he flees the presence of God. And while we would expect an angry God, a God who is seeking to wipe out the rebels, what we find in Genesis 3, 9 is a God who now pursues the rebels. And God cries out, where are you, Adam? And in that moment, how do you respond to that? A God who, when he should wipe me out, instead extends to me mercy and grace and invites me back into fellowship with him. How do you respond to that? I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm trembling with fear. There's a sense of awe. 
where you get to the next chapter, Genesis 4, 6, Cain's sacrifice has been rejected. And he's pouting. And again, in a moment where you expect God to rebuke Cain, God to come hard against Cain, what does God do? It's so surprising. And understanding His infinite holiness and His justice, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. God says to Cain, why are you angry? You're confronted with a God who pleads for sinners to turn from their sin. These are all inspiring texts of Scripture. Daniel 9, 20 through 27 is for me, and I hope it will be for you, an awe inspiring text. Now, lest you for a moment think that this is unimportant, I want to quickly remind you that awe is something that every one of us conscientiously or subconsciously seeks. Because all of us have been wired by God to seek our own satisfaction. So much of your life can be reduced to the pursuit of all. Why do you listen to a certain type of music? You find it awesome. Why do you go to certain restaurants? Because that type of cuisine to you, it's great! Why do you go on certain vacations or purchase certain things with reference to your house? Why do you enter into relationships? It's this, this unstated orientation of your heart that longs to be satisfied, that longs to be glad, that, that longs to be awed by something. And here's what we find. When we, in our sinfulness, find our awe in the creation alone, we walk further down a path of dissatisfaction, disobedience, dependence, and by that I really mean enslavement to the creation, and ultimately destruction. And we're just pursuing awe. And conversely, if we find our awe in God, or in a God-mediated interaction with the creation, we will, instead of that dark path, find ourselves walking a different road that's characterized by joy, obedience, increasing freedom, life. So what I'm trying to say is, to anyone who would say, awe is not important, it's much more critical than you think. Let me ask you a couple probing questions this morning. Are you right now? discontented with life? May I be so bold as to suggest to you that it's likely an awe problem? Do you find yourself right now really enslaved or increasingly trapped by a besetting sin, an addiction, a stubborn habit, Believe it or not, at the core of that struggle is an awe problem. Right now, are you overwhelmed by your circumstances, weary and perpetually seeking life's escapes? Netflix, Facebook, your favorite hobby, another football game. Can I get a witness, ladies? Another football game, more Fox News or CNN. You guessed it. This is an awe problem 
too. So this morning, I want to preach to you a message that I've entitled, More Than Just Amazing. Daniel 9, 20-27, I believe, is the most amazing prophecy in all of Scripture. I don't want you to walk away just impressed by Daniel's penchant for prophecy. Like, if you'll listen and stay awake, you'll leave today and you'll be like, whoa, that dude should have been a meteorologist. I don't want you walking away thinking about the wisdom of Daniel. Where I'm trying to lead you this morning is lead you back to a place where you stand in awe of your God. I believe that Daniel 9, 20 through 27 is well suited for the task. And after we pray here in a moment, I want to lead you down this path by asking you a series of questions. That will be the structure of the sermon. Six questions. We'll try to move rapidly. I'm warning you, this is a little different. But I think you'll think it's thoroughly biblical. I think I can convince you of that. Let's pray. Lord, help us. If there's any agenda in my heart, it's I want these dear, beloved people to be where I have been. That place of awe. What power. What transcendence. What might. What beauty. What order. What success we are confronted with here. And Lord, I pray that for every one of us, we would see our King more victorious than we've ever seen Him before. That we would have a greater appreciation of the cross and what our King accomplishes for us there. This can only be done through the gracious work of the Holy Spirit. We beg the work of the Spirit in this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number one is this. Listen carefully. What's happening in our text? All right, question number one. Really, it's the question you should, you should ask every time you sit down to read the Bible. What's happening in the text? Just, just don't dive in. The water could be freezing. Check the temperature. What's happening in the text? Now, if you weren't able to be with us last week, you should really go back and watch that. Daniel chapter 9 begins with Daniel studying the prophet Jeremiah. We think he's in chapter 25 and chapter 29, and as he studies Jeremiah's prophecies, he discerns the times in which he lives. You see, Daniel was a child of the exile. Daniel, through studying the prophet Jeremiah, perceives the truth of Scripture that the physical exile of Israel, Israel's time period spent in Babylonian captivity was predetermined by God to last for a duration of 70 years. It's plain in the text of Jeremiah, and Daniel perceives this. Daniel perceives that the prophet Jeremiah foretold that after 70 years, Babylon would fall. Not only would Babylon fall, but the Jews would physically return, the city would be rebuilt, the temple would be restored, and Daniel was rejoicing in his heart at the beginning of chapter 9 because he realized where he was in history. He was standing on the precipice. He's in his 80s. It's around 537 B.C. The Babylonian Empire has just fallen. Cyrus is at the helm. The anointed ruler prophesied of by Isaiah has stepped into power. Daniel knows that the time is nearing for God to bring the exiles home. The ears of Yahweh are now open to the prayers of his people. And so what does Daniel do? As he believes the sovereignty of God, he also embraces his personal responsibility to pray. And so we see a beautiful prayer where he repents and he laments and he calls upon God, Oh God, forgive us! He's praying the prayer that Solomon encouraged all of God's people to pray if they ever found themselves in exile. 
my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. As we get to the next portion, look what happens here in the text. He finishes his prayer. Notice what, it's, notice what it says here. Verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. That's a reference to Jerusalem. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, he touched me about the time of the evening oblation and he informed me and he talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Here's what's interesting, but it's consistent about God in the Old Testament. God, when he enters into covenant with his people, God does not like to withhold from his people his counsel. Do you remember Abram when he entertained the three visitors? One of which we believe to be the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. And do you remember the conversation that God had with two of the other angelic beings? when God said, should I withhold from Abram what I'm about to do? God, in his covenant-making ways, loves to share his heart and cultivate intimacy with his people. Now imagine this. Daniel, he's convinced the physical exile is over. And he's, he's praying and he's, he's taking hold of the promises of God. And he's, and he's interceding, and God in heaven is looking. God knows something. God has ordained something, but he's not yet told Daniel. And I'm imagining in the theater of my mind, there's a conversation in the Trinity. Should we withhold from Daniel? We love him. Gabriel is discharged. Gabriel comes to Daniel, and in this vision, in this vision, God will inform Daniel. Now, don't miss this. God will inform Daniel that while the physical exile is over, the spiritual exile of the people of God will not be accomplished for many more years. Not until the completion of 70 sabbatical cycles. Not until the completion of 10 years of Jubilee. Not until the passing of 490 years. God is going to remind Daniel that the second exodus will occur in two stages. Does, does that illusion make sense to you? Second exodus? First Exodus, the people were in Egypt. They were slaves in bondage. They were brought out of captivity to the land of promise. First Exodus. Second Exodus, God's people are now slaves, but they're in Babylon. God's going to return them to their land. God's going to bestow upon them a new blessing. Daniel understands the first part, the physical return. He's discerned it from the prophet Jeremiah. Stage two, the spiritual return to Yahweh. It's going to take some time. And God's even sovereign over that. Stage one will happen in Daniel's day through the anointed King Cyrus. Stage two will happen many years from Daniel through another anointed ruler. In fact, the very first song this morning was centered on him. The Messiah named Jesus. So in summary, I answer the first question, what's happening in our text with this statement? God is revealing to Daniel the timing of when the spiritual exile will truly end for the people of God. Question number two. We've looked at what's happening. Question number two, when will this happen? When will the people of God, more than just live in the land, when will the people of God spiritually be, be connected to Yahweh again? When will sin 
be ultimately dealt with? When will everlasting righteousness break into humanity? When? Let's look at our text. Starting in verse 24. Seventy weeks. A, a very literal translation would be this, 77s. We're not told if it's days, months, weeks, as far as a unit goes, years. That's not disclosed for us. 77s are determined upon your people, Daniel. That's the Jewish people, the people of God. Upon your holy city, that's the city Jerusalem, the place where God dwells with his people. Now, now notice what the angel says will happen at the end of the 77s, at the end of the 70 sabbatical cycles, at the end of the 10 jubilees, the 490 years. What's going to happen? And you have six statements in verse 24. There are three that are put in parallel with three. Three negatives and three positives. Let's just chew on these for a minute. I hope you don't get lost because each one of these is precious. Watch this now. To finish the transgression. You could also translate it this way. To put an end to rebellion. So at the end of these 490 years, God is somehow, in a decisive way, going to deal with human rebellion. Can I get an amen? Any struggling rebel? Amen? But he doesn't stop there. To make an end of sins. This is a doctrine that we call expiation. The removal of our guilt from us. How many would long for all your guilt, all your shame, concerning all of your sins, to be blotted out? To no longer be under condemnation. No more blood of bulls and goats. No more sacrifices. It'll happen at the end of 70 weeks. How many? Look what it says next. To make reconciliation for iniquity. This is an interesting phrase. It has the idea of propitiation. It's a doctrine that we call the penal substitution of Jesus, that when Jesus is on the cross, He bears God's specific and just wrath reserved towards your sin. Jesus drinks every last drop of that cup for you. Now look at the three positives that are listed here. To bring in everlasting righteousness. What did the Jews know? They knew a very temporary and fleeting righteousness. Like on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of the Atonement, the sins are wiped clean for like a moment. And then what happens? Then what happens? Like, as soon as the blood hits the altar, what happens? Someone else sins, right? Right? The righteousness that the Jews had known up to this point, it was so fleeting, so fleeting. What about an enduring righteousness? Wouldn't you love to be right with God permanently, finally, fully? To no longer have to carry a weight of pleasing God because God somehow, in some way, has already been pleased on your behalf. Wouldn't that be amazing? Everlasting righteousness. What a promise. Look what comes next. To seal up the vision and prophecy. I mean, don't you enjoy when prophecy gets fulfilled? At the end of the 490 years, it will. Now look at this. This last phrase is very intriguing. And to anoint the most holy. To anoint the holy holy. Here, here's what's interesting. We don't know if it's a thing, place, or a person. It's specifically vague. 
But here's what we're told. At the end of the 77s, a thing or a person that is holy, holy, will be anointed and recognized by all. Now, I'm going to tip my hand a little bit. I believe it's a person and a place. They're one. Jesus, who is the true temple of God. Now watch this. When will this happen? At the completion of a 490-year period. Question number three. Who will cause this to happen? Like these good things, these good things that are advertised and promised. Who makes it happen? Now, you could initially, without even reading the text, because you're familiar with the themes of Daniel, you could initially answer, well, I'm sure it's the Most High God, the Sovereign One who rules the heavens and the kingdoms of men. Is that not a theme all throughout the, the book of Daniel? It is. And I would answer initially, oh, of course, God the Father, the Sovereign One in heaven, makes all that does happen, happen. Okay? But, but we cannot read the text and not be confronted with an important figure. Let's read the text and I'll try to highlight it for you. Look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, we're going to have to find that in history. When was a command given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? That's going to start the 77s. But then notice what it says next. Until that word, that word, the commandment, that word goes forth, and until Messiah the Prince, now notice that the 70 weeks are split into three parts. Shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks, and then in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, a reference to the 70th week. So we have an unnatural division of the 70s. But notice the focus is on a person, and I want to help you dive deeper into the English translation. That term that's translated the Messiah is a Hebrew term that means the anointed one, and the term that's translated prince is a very generic term that, that refers to a king, a ruler, an emperor, a governor, so, so, there's going to be, here's what Daniel is finding out. There's going to be a word from God to cause the city to be rebuilt. There also, at some point in the future, is going to come a person, an anointed one, who will rule. Now, if you have any awareness of the other visions of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, this is not the first time we're told about a rock not cut with hands that comes from the heavens. It's not the first time there's a son of Adam that steps out of the mass in the heavenly assembly who is given a kingdom that will not end. These are repeated themes in the book of Daniel. And we're told about someone who's going to come Now watch this. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So I want you to understand this real clearly. There's going to be seven weeks. So there's going to be a period of 49 years. In that 49-year period, the city will be restored. In a 49-year period, the city will be restored. Then there's going to be a 62-week period. 62 sabbatical cycles. 400 and in total, including the first seven weeks, 483 years total from when the word went forth, this anointed one who will rule will die. The Messiah will be cut off. Now look at this. It's amazing. Look at this. It says at the verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Look at this careful prophetic word. But not for himself. His death will be for a purpose. It will be for others. It will be vicarious. It will be substitutionary. Now, there are other things that are going to happen. This all happens in verse 26 after the 69th week. 
I understand that to mean in the 70th week, the Messiah is cut off. In the 70th week, the people of the prince, the people of the Messiah, through their actions, will cause the city and the temple to be destroyed. And all of this will usher in some sort of judgment. If you look at the end of verse 26, the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, verse 27, I'm going to suggest this to you. We're not to, to read this linear. That's, that's what we would do based on our cultural context. A Jew would read this almost like a stereo setting, the left and right speaker. This is a recasting of verse 26. It's being recasted in verse 27. He, that is the Messiah, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That term many, I'll make a prophetic connection to that that I think you'll find to be very helpful. Now watch this. In the midst of the 70th week, he... Again, we're, we're only introducing one person in this text. It is a Messiah. It is a ruler that will come. He will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Let's stay, track, let's stay on track with my questions. We're going to get to all the details that you might be curious about as we go through the questions. What I've asked so far, what's happening in our text, I've told you, God's telling Daniel, when will the spiritual exile be complete? Secondly, when will this happen? At the completion of 490 years, 77s. Three, who will cause this to happen? Yes, it's God, Yahweh, it's the high king of heaven, but this is all mediated through a Messiah, an anointed one, a prince that will come. Question number four, how will he accomplish this? And I just want you to pause for a minute. How will rebellion be dealt with? Guilt be removed? How will God's wrath be absorbed? How will everlasting righteousness break into humanity? How will prophecy be fulfilled? How will the holy place or person be anointed? When is all of this coming together? How will this be accomplished? My answer, we know it's through this Messiah, it's through this Prince. How will it happen? Verse 26 and 27 informs us in two ways. In verse 26, through His cross work. He will be cut off. But not for Himself. Isn't that ironic? The king is victorious through defeat. In dying, he brings life. But it's not just his cross work. It's a new covenant that is confirmed. I want you to hold your place in Daniel 9, and if you'll entertain me for a moment, I want you to flip over to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Turn there quickly. In Isaiah 53, we are specifically focused prophetically on the Messiah, the servant of Yahweh. The servant of Yahweh is the one who brings Israel out of spiritual exile. I want you to focus in on verses 11 and 12. I want you to see that the prophet Isaiah seized upon a word. The word is translated in English, many. In our English translation, it appears three times. I believe that it could be translated in such a way to where it appears four times. And I think it's significant. I'll try not to lose you in the details. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. In Isaiah 53, the servant of Yahweh dies. Many of you are familiar with this text. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to His own way. But the Lord laid on Him, the servant of Yahweh, the iniquity of us all. It's talking about the cross. Verse 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise Him. He put Him to grief. And when He will make His soul an offering for sin that connects us to Daniel 9, the Father will see His seed. 
He will prolong his days. That's resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's the return from exile. Now watch this, verses 11 and 12. He shall see the travail of his soul, the Messiah's soul, and he, the Father, will be satisfied by his knowledge, the knowledge, the gospel of the Messiah, shall my righteous servant justified... And read the next word with me. Many. For he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the... Now this word that's translated strong is a Hebrew word that has one of two meanings. Strong or many. I think the context constrains the translation to be many. The emphasis that Isaiah wants you to understand is that what this servant does applies to many, 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 many. And it's the same thing Daniel said. He'll make a covenant with many. Now watch this. Verse 12. He'll divide the spoil with the, I would translate it, many. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressions, and he bare the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. Go back to Daniel 9. What I am suggesting to you is this, that Daniel, through this message of Gabriel, foresees that at an end of a period that he does not completely understand, at an end of 77s, there will be an anointed one, a ruler that will come. This anointed one and this ruler that will come, in the 70th week, he will be cut off. In the 70th week, in the midst of that 70th week, verse 27 will tell us that he makes a covenant with many. What did Jesus say on the night of his betrayal in the upper room? He turned the Passover into a new ordinance. And he lifted the cup when he had supped and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Now watch this. I'm in Daniel 9 again. I'm in Daniel 9 verse 27. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is during the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Something that this Messiah does. We know he's cut off, but in being cut off, he causes an end of sacrifice. Do you recall something that was split as Jesus hung upon the cross? A veil in the temple? No more offerings. No more sacrifices. And for the overspreading of abominations, he will make it desolate. Judgment is going to come upon the holy city. Even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. All right, my other questions that I'm going to ask should address any questions you might have here in a minute. So let's quickly review, and I will hasten. What's happening in our text? God's talking about the end of the spiritual exile. When will this happen? At the completion of 70 weeks. Who will cause this to happen? Messiah the Prince. How will he accomplish it? Well, he will be cut off and he will confirm a covenant. Question number five. Did God keep his word? Did God keep his word? Are you ready for awe? I would suggest to you, yes. Yes. Let me go through some details. If you have a pen, you might jot, jot it down. You can meditate on this further later. In 537 B.C., Cyrus issues a word allowing the Jews to return to their land. However, as we study this early history of the physical return, their pursuit of rebuilding the city, the pursuit of rebuilding the temple, it's fraught with difficulty, and it's halted by Israel's enemies. It's halted until 457 B.C. That's an important date. 457. A new ruler, Artaxerxes, reauthorizes the initial word that Cyrus gave. And now Nehemiah is empowered, Ezra is empowered to see the city fully restored and completed. History records this happening 
in 407 BC. Now, if you do math, from 457 to 407 is how many years? Roughly 49 years. Seven sevens. Exactly what Daniel said. Now, if we'll take that date, 407 BC, and if that's the beginning of the next 62 weeks, you're probably catching by now, I see no interruption in the 70 weeks. If we'll take that as the beginning of the next 62 weeks, that will take us from 407 BC to 27 AD. Who was beginning his public ministry in 27 AD? History records Jesus to be born somewhere between 4 BC and 0 AD. Who was beginning his public ministry right around the age of 30? Jesus. Now watch this. So the beginning of the 70th week would then be 27 AD. Every historian that's respectable places the crucifixion of Jesus somewhere between 27 AD and 34 AD. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment how long was Jesus' earthly ministry? Three and a half years. And then what happened? He was cut off. And you and I should stand in awe. And what happened, friend? I, I know that there are many that believe the 70th week is still yet to happen. I respect that. Here's why I disagree. There's textual reasons, but there are other reasons. Rebellion's been dealt with, friend at the cross. My guilt was taken care of at the cross. The wrath of God for my sin was absorbed at the cross. Everlasting righteousness became mine at the cross. Prophecy was beautifully... Now, you know that there are these categories. There's a difference between fulfillment and fullness. Prophecy was beautifully fulfilled by none other than Jesus. And where did he fulfill these visions and prophecies? At the cross. And the Holy One was truly and beautifully anointed where? Above all places. After the cross, through his resurrection. Now, someone might say, well, but Pastor, don't you understand that the city was not destroyed until 70 A.D.? I know. Do you understand in Genesis 3 when Adam sins, the Scriptures say, the day you eat of the fruit, you'll die. Did he die that day? Don't say no, because you're calling God a liar. Well, in what sense did Adam die the very day he ate of the fruit? Through his rebellion, his fate was sealed. I'm suggesting to you a reading of Daniel 9 where you understand that the people of the prince desolated the temple when they blasphemed God's son, when they unjustly tried him, and when they put him to a wicked death. And in their rejection of the true temple, their desolation of he who was the dwelling place of God, their fate on that day was sealed. It was only a matter of time before the hand of God's wrath fell with all fury on Jerusalem and its temple. Last question, and we're done. How do you respond? I have one answer. Awe. Let me remind you of what all means. It's a reverential fear and it's an overwhelming sense of wonder. Well, Pastor, what should I fear? And I say this with every ounce of seriousness in my body. You ought tremble to the point of death at desecrating God's temple.
Jesus. The loving Father will not pardon anyone who rebelliously refuses to submit to his Son. There is a fate that awaits you that is far worse than the destruction of the Jewish city and temple in AD 70 by the Roman general Tacitus. There's a destruction far greater that awaits you if you deny Him. You will pay hell. But awe is not just a reverential fear. Oh friend, I hope you're afraid of a life that's not submitted to Jesus. I hope you're afraid of that. You ought to be. Awe is also an amazing sense of wonder. Do you understand that the covenant has been confirmed? Do you get that? Do you understand that your rebellion's been dealt with? Do you understand that the guilt and shame has already been taken care of? Do you understand that God's wrath's already been absorbed? Do you understand that right now, everlasting righteousness can be, or if you're a believer, is yours? Do you understand the prophecy's been fulfilled, and yet we await its fullness? Do you understand that the Holy One has been anointed, and you have eyes to see, and you ought to respond to that with an overwhelming sense of, God, I am not worthy. God, thank you. And that awe should fuel the way you treat your wife, the way you spend your money, the way you prioritize your schedule, your involvement in the local assembly your commitment to God's Word, your heart for the nations, your love for King Jesus. How do I know that the covenant is mine? Do you know that Paul in Ephesians tells us? If you're a believer, you've received a down payment of that inheritance called who? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. It's mine. It's mine. Man, I hope I just put you on shouting ground. It's mine. I end with this. Isaiah 66, 2. The prophet declares, to whom will Yahweh look. And the looking of God thematically in Scripture implies the grace and the favor and the kindness of God. To whom will Yahweh look? Who will God bless? And then the prophet, after he asks the question, he gives the answer. And here's what he says. To the one who has all you say, preacher, I know Isaiah 66 too. That is not how it's translated. You're right. Here's how it's translated. To the one who trembles at my word. Does your life reflect that you have an awe concerning the living word of God, Jesus Christ? Does your life reflect that you have an awe concerning the written word of God? Is it everything to you? Is it really the means by which your soul will flourish? Does that break out into the everyday activities of your life? I want God to look towards me. Well, if that's the case, the answer is all. Daniel 9 serves it up pretty well. Let's pray. Father, I don't know the Bible exhaustively. There might be small disputations that some would have 
concerning whether or not the 70th week has been fulfilled. Yet, Lord, may every one of us leave this place absolutely convinced that the Messiah has come and He has made a new covenant. And by Your grace, we have believed and we have entered in. Already, but not yet. Lift our eyes off of our circumstances. Turn our affections away from this world as if it could satisfy. And give us faith, Father, to truly believe You are a God filled with love and mercy who desires to satisfy His creation. That Your satisfaction transcends all imposter satisfactions. And may we drink deeply and submit ourselves completely to the Word, to Your Son, to what He has spoken through the prophets. In Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen.